Hey guys, what's cracking? Godsman here, coming at you with another tier list video. It's been a while since I've done one of these. I might have even been over a year since the last time. I don't know why I haven't been on these more often, but I'm trying to be better about it, and I decided, hey, I have that itch, let's scratch it today. And it's really convenient timing, because with Set 2 just releasing, we have this whole bounty of new decks to try out. Everyone's been around playtesting, and I got around to just completing my playtesting in some of the relevant decks, like Liel, Mordo, uh, trying out the new Rezael card cards, etc, etc. So now that we have the reveal of all the seven faded ones and each of the nations have at least a couple of Divine Z era ride lines under the belt, I decided now was the perfect time to evaluate them and see which ones are viable, which ones are pretty good, and which ones might need a little bit of help to keep up with the rest. Uh, and a couple of notes about this tier list, I have uh, more than just the Divine Z decks as you can tell down here. I'm also going to not just be looking at the core boosters and the starter deck ones, but I'm also going to be looking at, at some of the relevant will dress decks that we got prior because there's a lot of them that's been pretty meta viable whether it be rogue or meta dominant i'm looking at you shiranui and they're worth addressing in this tier list not just because they are relevant in the current format but also because they give certain benchmarks of power and they are viable for more support in the future which even if they were relevant a while ago they could easily become relevant again of course, don't flame me in the comments that I couldn't have every single deck here. I mean, man, if I did include like all the promo ride line stuff, uh, we'd be here all day. This list would be twice as long and there's no way I can get it at that. No one got time for that. So I'm only going to be choosing a lot of the more recent or relevant units to look at today. Good? Good. Uh, and of course, one last thing, this is complete completely subjective because I have to use my opinions here. Yes, there is some topping data here, but some of that data is outdated. Some of that data may be contextualized by the size of the tourney or the rules of said tourney. So it's a little bit dubious what kind of tops you can see from one deck versus another. So even though I am gonna be considering that in my evaluations of these units, the principal thing is gonna be based on my perception of their strength and their potential and how well they do because i've played this game for a good deal now especially this format i invested a lot of time into it and so i think i have some pretty solid opinions on most of these guys here so this is going to be a very subjective tier list and of course in the nature of being subjective and having a personal opinion you too can share me your personal opinions down in the comment section below i will read them and i'll try to respond to them to the best of my ability because there's a lot to discuss here so even if i miss something with one of these guys or i mess something up let me know but i'm only human at the end of the day so i'm just going to try my best here right okay let's get into it so we're going to start with the starter deck boss for dragon empire this guy uh, he's not very good right it's just a very basic gimmick i do like that all of them get persona ride but the problem is that between the energy blast four for a pretty middling effect and the lack of a dedicated win condition to the deck it's just a very basic retired beatdown kind of strategy there's not a lot going on here so he's pretty simple on the other end of the spectrum, we've got the probably meta Varga Dragress. Uh, again, when looking at these, it's very subjective, but there have been a lot of tops with Varga Dragress, right? This deck is very much hyped. And I know JP has more of a tendency to go on high rolly kind of decks. They hype them up a bit because they have smaller tournaments in general. So you're able to take high roll decks, like IE Gold Paladin with the one Percival for Gurgit, right? That was topping like crazy because you didn't have to go through many rounds and a very large tournament in order to make that top. Case in point, Varga Dragress is sort of the same way. This deck is definitely very pressuring and very lethal. However, it does have a sort of a tempo thing to it where you need to hit the triggers on the Divine Skill turn in order to really seal the deal. And if you can't seal the deal, then you're going to have two problems. One is you're going to leave your opponent with a lot of counter blast and make them very angry where they'll try to finish you off because you may not have a lot of cards in hand. The twin drive on the the second restand does help with that but especially against field control matchups you're having to call more units and invest entirely the field to maximize the kill so you could be left a bit vulnerable there another really big problem is Varga Dragress doesn't have an easy counter charge option you could play things like Gojo or there's another one. Um, I forget his name, Ethan. Ethan, that's his name, right? You could play those options. They're not very good. They're not worth it. But counter charge is definitely necessary for this deck because once it does its first turns where it CBs two on its own, you're CBing for Shura. 
that's going to limit him on your CB for the turn. So if you can't do it, then your follow-up is pretty crappy. So that is its critical flaw. But when you do hit triggers and things do go your way, this deck basically steamrolls anything else in the format. It's like V Overlord all over again, except it's a bit more balanced and prone to flaws. Uh, actually, V Overlord was the same way. Uh, the end was also the same way until uh, the cross. That kind of reduced a lot of its flaws, but that's a V-series discussion thing, so I'll leave it there. Next up is uh, Griandra. Griandra is a pretty solid deck, right? Griandra has really high numbers, and it also has really good early rush. So this deck is really strong that way. The thing about it is this deck doesn't scale too terribly hard. Like sure, it hits pretty hard and it hits you four times, but that's basically all it is. It doesn't have a lot of X factors like a ton of retires or guard restricts or stuff like that. It's just big beatdown.exe. So without a lot of the X factors there, it's pretty easy to navigate this matchup and just play honest Vanguard with it. But the rushdown is pretty important. And you're gonna notice that I put a bit more emphasis on decks that can rush because we're in a rush meta. Between the stride deck sets, which scale super hard in the late game and also the plethora of strategies which can beat you down on turn two and turn three, even without the opponent's vanguard being at grade three or greater. Irrespective of that, they can attack you immediately and a lot. And that is really good in this format because we lack a lot of punish for early rush. And it's basically the Wild West out here where is that concerned. So those decks are going to get a bit of an advantage on this tier list. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why this guy is pretty solid. He's actually going to be near the top of very solid. But I don't know if he's necessarily very viable because without that extra X factor, as I said, he's probably fairly manageable as things stand, but feel free to correct me in the comments. This dude, uh, I, yeah, he, this is a pretty gimmicky ride line. It just got revealed. It's a promo ride line. There's not a lot going to it. Uh, I actually, in making this tier list, I added some stuff, but this was from a, a base tier list uh, by Curly Haired Hero. Uh, I think that's Curly Haired Vanguard. He has another YouTube channel. I, I don't know for sure, but it's probably him. Uh, it's, this guy's pretty base, so go go and give him credit for this tier list. I added some a few stuff at the end here because I felt like it was relevant to discussion. This I didn't add, though. I don't even know why it's here. I don't really know a lot about it, but it didn't seem all that impressive, but looked kind of fun at least. Eugene. Um, Eugene is neat but flawed. So Eugene recently got new support. It was a support for both it and Gondiva, and it helped the deck get more multi-attack. And that was really nice because Eugene was lacking some offensive pressure to back up its field retires. However, even with that, Eugene does have a couple flaws. One is, is that the deck doesn't necessarily have a lot going for it. Sure, it has some pretty good retires, but aside from the retires, it's a pretty basic multi-attack turn that's somewhat piece-reliant. It requires very specific pieces to get that going. So it seems kind of strong on the front end, but it's sort of a glass cannon when it tries to beat down. So it doesn't have a lot of the kill potential there. Another issue with Eugene that I've noticed is that it has a really big reliance on Oswald. Oswald is the grade one that lets your Eugene restand for multi-attack. Not only do you need to see Oswald, but Oswald also has a weakness, which is that it needs your opponent to have exactly zero rear guards. When they have even one, Oswald's shut off, and thus a lot of the deck's potential is shut off. That's an issue. If a deck has a resist unit or they just put too many units on the board in the later game for you to retire at that state of the game, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. So it has some very apparent flaws to it and the strengths of the deck don't make up for those flaws. So it's going to go down here for the time being. Nirvana Java. Uh, Nirvana Java, this is actually going to be a bit of a tough one for me. Nirvana Java actually has received some tops uh, recently. It even got a world's top at one point. I think it was like third or something like that. This deck is actually very viable. Now, this may surprise some people because Java has traditionally been seen as this under-supported or overly gimmicky deck that doesn't do a lot, but the deck has been steadily racking up a lot of leggy support over the years. Uh, years, I say, but really it's over the sets, I should say. In particular, it had a new one, right? And this new one, it's an Energy Blast 3. And what it does is it lets you continuously cycle back your cross overdress units and give you more advantage. This is a very important prior dragon because what it allows Java to do essentially is recur your Straw Virenas or your Mirrors Virenas. 
and those are very important pieces. Your cross over dresses are in general one of the toughest things for you to get. And yes, you do have recurrence pieces like Vils, but the crucial failing of Vils is that you don't want to make Vils in the first place because Vils is already requiring a Trick Star and a Prayer Dragon on the field just to make it, just to get back your cross overdress unit. So this simplifies that process and makes Vils unnecessary anymore, which is a really big godsend. Perhaps another of the big things about this card is that it gives you a sort of loop going on. See, if you use it and then you make Mirrors Vibrina by it, what you do then is you'll use Mirrors Vibrina, you'll detach materials, get counter charge, get draws. Then you intercept with Mirrors Vibrina, and then on the next turn, you recur him back to the field, and then it will get back your Mirrors Vibrina, meaning that you can Mirrors Vibrina all over again. So as long as you've got this dude and Mirrors, bada bing, bada boom, you can keep looping that every turn for more resource engines. It's really, really nice. And for the simple cost of an Energy Blast 3, you can keep using this guy every single turn because you're naturally gaining 3 energy. So it was a huge upgrade to Java's ability as a deck. It was one of the final pieces that it needed to really have that cycle going for it. So I personally interpret it as being very viable. It can also burst you out of nowhere really easily thanks to Straw Virena. And if you're going for more of uh, the Overdress style of things, I'm not sure why you would, but you can use Arcs on turn 2. That's always been a classic play to beat down the opponent early. Early. But there have been some results for Java, and I know Java's potential very well because my buddy Naps, he he really takes that deck to new height. He showed me how that card worked, and yeah, I had to give it some credit here. So Java, to me, it's very viable. I'm not sure if it's on the probably meta, uh, but I'd say it's very viable. This guy, it's just like the other one. Uh, it's not very good. It's pretty under-supported. I don't like it very much, and so that's all there is to say about it. Gandiva, uh, ooh, Gandiva's pretty solid. Got, like with Eugene, Gondiva got that new card, right? So you're getting more attack pressure with that card, which is super nice for you. And Gondiva does have a pretty good bulwark in terms of its retire, just like Eugene does. But where it surpasses Eugene is that Gondiva doesn't have very much piece reliance to it. Sure, you can use your pieces, but a lot of your pieces are interchangeable in nature. A lot of them do just rack up your binds, get you retires, get you draw power. They do it in similar ways, not exactly the same way, but in similar ways. And it's the same basic goal. And because a lot of your power is coming from Gondiva, along with his crit pressure, yeah, and that being centralized in the Vanguard is making it a lot more stable than Eugene. Now, it's only pretty solid because whereas Gondiva was top dog a few formats ago due to its power gain being like strike deck set level, but even easier to attain, nowadays the power threshold of a lot of decks have risen up to meet Gondiva's level. So Gondiva is only about average, or I'll be even a little bit slow depending on the deck you're comparing it to so for that reason it still needs to fall back on its retires in order to really give it that x factor so it's a lot like eugene but at least its offense is a bit better than eugene so that's why it's going to fall in the pretty solid here this is going to be an interesting one direful dolls i feel is slept on this deck is absolutely bonkers the thing about Direful Dolls is its ability to plus is astronomical, out of this world. Not only do you get effectively a plus four, as long as your opponent's vanguards are great three or greater, note you're calling three from the soul and getting an extra drive, but your Direful Dolls keep binding themselves. Now, Andrald, I, I'm, I'm just going to call him Arnold, but it's some sort of doll pun with his name, right? Uh, Arnold here, he has a skill where he keeps calling from the bind zone and gives it extra 5k shield. That on top of the shield power of some of your units, and they're pretty considerable shields from the bind zone you have a lot of them and then the deck is able to recycle the cards that you guard with from the drop zone back to the bind or into the soul then to the field then to the bind it's a very cyclical deck so you can continuously have access to 5 10 or even 15k shielders from the bind zone for every single attack on top of the plus four that you're getting that's insane this deck has insane resourcing Funnily enough, it's right next to Vargo Dragress, and it has the same issue as Vargo Dragress. The one thing that's keeping Direful Dolls from truly blowing up, in my opinion, is Counter Charge. It is somewhat held back by its Counter Blast to go all out. So when it doesn't have Counter Blast, then you can't use Arnold's main skill, and from there you kind of flop like a fish. But as long as you have even one Counter Blast open, it's showtime. One of its main attacking pieces only uses energy. 
that's really easy. So yeah, deck is pretty simple. It gives you insane amount of grind and resource advantage. And yeah, this could honestly deck out a lot of different decks in the format, which is super crazy. Uh, and speaking of deck out, we've got Blaine the Maya. This, this one's very viable. Blanked Meyer is one of the more recent ones, so I'm going to explain him a little bit in case some of you guys don't know what's up with this guy. He was the second to last faded one to be revealed. The thing about Blanked Meyer is it binds cards from your soul face down, and for that, you're able to bind some of your opponent's rear guards face down. But the main keynote with this dude is his divine skill. With this divine skill, as long as you have eight or more face down cards in the bind zone, you're able to give him a crit and prevent your opponent from using sentinels for the rest of that turn once he attacks. In addition, your opponent's vanguard loses all of their abilities until the end of their turn. Note, they still keep Persona Ride, and if you ride over it, the new vanguard will keep their abilities. But that's just sort of a side thing to really annoy the opponent. The main bit is it gets huge numbers. It's a really large vanguard with critical and sentinel restrict, right? It feels like V-Series all over again. And because the sentinel restrict is turn wide, this is a very devastating turn to get through, especially on Persona Ride. It has a rear guard, which for the price of Energy Blast 3, gets 5,000 power and a critical every time it attacks. That's a really powerful rear guard. And that means that if you have two of them on either side of the field, Energy Blast 6, if you save up for it, it's a pretty easy cost to make. Your entire front row can't be sentineled they have pretty big power and they all have criticals so your opponent could be dead quite easily however blind Meyer does have a couple weaknesses to it one is the strategy of the deck is very linear and telegraphed your opponent will for the entire course of the game be trying to accrue resources to get over the blind Meyer skill they'll also be trying to find ways to get around the blind Meyer skill to the best of their ability whether it's having ot to hard guard in the hand if they're able to use some blade its orders to guard, that's another one. If you're either Rezael or Leal Morda, you can use Leal Morda's uh, Guardian Circle skill to nullify the attack without it being considered a Sentinel, so we can get around the Sentinel Restrict, things like that, right? So because it's very telegraphed and it's once per game, unlike say Drag Strider Luard, you can get around it. And this does lead to Blaine Meyer's other problem. I mentioned the whole deck out game with Arnold and deck out is very real for Blankmire. This deck between the selective soul charging, putting cards into soul from the top deck, which is a difference. Their card effects do specify a difference between place by card ability and soul charge, and the massive amount of drawing this deck does. This deck draws a lot. You're going to be decking out. Likely by turn five or turn six, you're gone. You have no more deck left. So you're on a timer. You only have a limited number of turns to take down the opponent. So especially tanky decks could get around this. Of course, Blaine Meyer's ability to shut down skills from the Vanguard can get over stuff like this. But even still, a general Blaine Meyer for attack turn, Arnold's going to be able to use two of those four attacks and use the bind zone before it gets shut down. So that's still some pretty good value there and more potential just to survive the Blaine Meyer. And once you do, once you survive the Blaine Meyer turn, the deck isn't that big of a deal. Especially if you happen to be a field control deck, you can wipe out their important pieces and then go and take the game to the touchdown. So for that reason, I'm going to say it's very viable, but it's not probably meta. It is fairly linear and manageable, all things considered, albeit if you're not very good at the fundamentals of Vanguard, you can probably put yourself in OTK range of this deck kind of easily, so you got to be careful of it. Barrel Magnus is very undersupported. Uh, it hasn't been good in a long time. Uh, deck is basically a high speed OTK turn three, all or nothing kind of deck. Get to 15 soul and win that turn or you're done for. And that's not very good. Uh, you might think it's good because speed is key, but it's so unstable in how it does it. And it's, it's, it's a one trick pony. Unlike a lot of the other decks like say Java there, where even though they can beat you down kind of early or even Andre where they can beat you down early, their turns afterwards, they're still pretty good. But Barrow Magnus just doesn't have the card advantage to survive past that one turn. I, hell, I brought this thing to locals recently and I got demolished. I got 4 trying to clown with Barrow Magnus there. The state of the game is just well beyond what this guy can manage. So I'm sorry for that. Astroa, uh, Astroa is pretty solid. This is mainly because it got a lot of support, right? Uh, some of the support is like, 
I forget some of the names, but they have a new grade one where you're able to selectively get cards into the soul into the hand for a counter blast. And then afterwards, you're also able to enable your mask version. Similarly, they have a, another grade one that puts itself in the soul to get a grade three off top seven. So there are ways to get around the mask version's main weaknesses, right? which is that it needs the base Unica in Soul in order to get the drive and the retire every turn. However, another one of the issues with Asheroa is that this skill costs a counter blast. And the deck can get kind of counter blast heavy because a lot of your important cards, like that grade one, like Lindol Kia, uh, perhaps Clean Sweep you go that direction with it, they all use counter blast. So over the course of a couple turns, that's going to get kind of heavy. Uh, but it does scale to critical triggers unlike the base version. It does have multi-attack like unlike the base version. So those are some really good points for it. However, I am going to say that both Unica and it are pretty similar. So this is going to encompass both of those slots. So imagine as if they're side by side because they're pretty neck and neck, right? They have their respective advantages and disadvantages. Personally, I think base Unica is a little bit better because I like the added stability since the mask engine is not guaranteed and it adds a little bit of clunkiness to it. But the payoff is potentially massive. Like you can beat down the opponent way harder than you could with Unica, albeit Unless you run the under, unless you run the order, you're not going to be able to get a critical on this one. So that is a little bit of an issue. Keep it in mind. But still, overall, I'd say it's pretty solid. As the tier list goes on, it's going to get lower on the pretty solid. But it's just because of the recent support, it is kind of there at a more basic level, right? This is a trial deck boss. It's not as uh, it's about as bad as the other ones, right? Just under supported. So it's going right there. Rezael. Ooh, Rezael is probably meta. Rezael has two key benefits that puts it over here in the top rung. One is it's one of the top Keter decks. Keter is the nation with probably the strongest foundational support to it. Anything you would need in a Keter deck, there is a generic Keter card that is pretty strong that fulfills that need, right? You need a generic Beater, you've got Sajus. You need generic Soul, well, Sajus can do it for you again. You can put cards in the Soul with something like Turnar. Turnar also gives you Counter Charge. Uh, for the case of Rezael and Leo Amorta, you also get Counter Charge from the Gragown that just got released alongside the Leo Amorta card, so that's another Counter Charge you can get. Uh, so you've got counter charge covered for these kind of decks. You have superior calls from the deck with things like Caper. Uh, you have the ability of Kate Walla to filter out cards from the deck to the hand. Selgam, which is the best support card of the entire nation, is like this as well. So you can just get a lot of cards in your hand. If you need multi-attack, anything that calls during the battle phase can utilize Caber to call over that. If you want easy soul and also the potential to call off of it, if you sack well enough, Drilling Angel is good for that. There is no task that a Keter unit cannot fill for you. So just by being a Keter deck, you have a lot of consistency and a lot of resource incursion at your disposal. So it just comes down to what the Vanguard provides you. And Rezael uses the Keter card pool extremely well. Its main skill to call cards from the drop zone means that a lot of your Keter cards, which will retire, can be brought back to the field. This is particularly good with Kate Walla and Selgown, the two that I mentioned before. They both retire themselves in order to add cards to your hand. So when you use that, you swing with them in a call. You get rid of them. Rezael is going to attack, bring them back. They swing again, and then they get rid of themselves yet again to get two more cards to hand. And just like that, you were able to get a plus four to the hand lickety split just for a couple soul and a counter plus. That's super good and it's super stable. You have a lot of a toolbox when Rezael's disposal. This guy can call back anything. Sajus, as I've already mentioned. You have access to Nobius for more calls, more beating. You have the new Nibiris. Uh, uh, I think it's Nilbiris, that's his name. He energy blasts three and moves into soul in order to draw a card and then stack your deck. Stacking the deck is very important in this particular version of the deck because, well, in particular version of Keter, I should say, because there's only really one way to play Rezael, it feels like, even though you can toolbox it, Rezael is just the overarching vanguard that encapsulates everything. His divine skill is pretty good. Getting a six damage shield with any trigger is fairly pog. It gives you that extra X factor that makes you more grindy, in addition to a lot of the card advantage you're already accruing. One thing that holds Rezael back, however, is that the deck doesn't have the greatest offensive potential. Your best means of gaining a lot of offense is Persona riding for 10k power and using Sajes to gain more power if the opponent hits a defensive or is already above 14k base. 
that is pretty good, but it can kind of flounder and it feels like you're not getting anywhere if the opponent happens to have a huge hand because they can kind of ward you off pretty easily. So that is one of the things that makes me a little bit tentative putting Reze up here, but I think his mid range is superb and he has a lot of options at his disposal. And in terms of potential, he has a lot of growth potential because this is a main character deck. So we're gonna have to look out for him a lot. Be certain of that. Liel Amorta is, I'd say, very viable. So Liel isn't probably meta because Liel does have uh it, it just released so it doesn't have anything to its name in terms of results and playing the deck myself i do think the deck is quite stable and it's quite consistent but it does have reliance on seeing the persona even more so than something like Rezael varga who needs it for power this needs it for power and because you need to actually see the extra copy of your vanguard to get the divine skill off which is a little bit of an issue the deck also has a soul best uh, soul blast problem you Soul Blast for a lot of skills. Edidas, which is your main grade two, Soul Blast, your main booster, uh, Euphemia or Euphoria, something like that. It's weird names, right? That Soul Blast to get her effect off. You can Soul Blast for other cards like Kaber if you're running Kaber, so on and so forth. So Soul is kind of precious and you're Soul Blasting for the ride line as well. So it's a lot of Soul gone that way. So you may need to include options to accrue Soul, but in doing so, that also can kind of clog up your strategies because unlike a lot of Keter decks, which due to their consistency, you could opt to run a lot of like three or two ofs and just get a good pull to work from you basically have to play a lot of four ofs in leo morta because her skill specifically requires you to have extra copies of the card in the deck on your rearguard circles so that you can bind them and call for the i would like to call the persona leap right it's like a time leap but with the same card name that does limit its deck creativity a fair bit which is a bit of an issue but the x factor of her defensive skill where you put back cards in the bind zone in order to get the pseudo sentinel a la ace style is a really nifty benefit that is pretty strong and if the deck not only gets an answer to its soul problem but also it gets a card that helps you search layout immorta or recur it back easier then the deck is golden then it can use its stable game plan and have every element of it called for you'll be good to go at that point but in its initial infancy here it's just very viable i would say you can still get a lot done but it's going to be pretty near the bottom on that end you got Celiron. Uh, Celiron is neat but flawed. Unfortunately, the problem with Celiron is that it still requires you to take a gamble on the top card if you don't have anything stacked in the deck. You have a lot of deck stackers, but in compromised game states, you're still going to inherently rely on a gamble, so needing to maintain that is a bit of a taxing thing to do. Furthermore, a lot of the Celiron support, it did give it more power, more resources, multi attack all that good stuff but it only gets you up to about the average, right? What what these other two do. So it has to maintain just to get up there, but because it does have a pretty clear weakness, it's more towards Eugene here, but I will put it in front of Eugene at the very least. Trial deck, we already discussed this. Wellstra. Wellstra is pretty solid. So Wellstra does have a resource problem. It doesn't have a lot of card advantage to it. And that's gonna put this guy like towards the middle or the bottom of the pretty solid tier but where Wellstra does have an advantage right is its offensive power is pretty nutty because of the divine skill you're able to get fry shoots maximum going as soon as turn three with the different operators that you got like Truel and fry height and also Wellstra himself you could be operating like three to four times in a turn and that's a lot of operates are using it on fry shoots maximum fry shoots maximum retiring an opponent's rear guard and limiting them by an extra 5k sort of like the zeal game plan for all of you dp players that means your attacks are hitting extremely hard i mean imagine something like a fry shoots maximum coming at you for 33k and the opponent is at negative two the amount of shield that you need to overcome that it feels like you're playing against Dragult Ignis, right? So there's a lot of power. And the X Factor, the retires, is also kind of like Ignis, but you can potentially retire even more. But you are very limited by your Counter Blast because you need Counter Blast for Fright Shoots Maximum, you need Counter Blast for Troll. Counter Blasts are your more most precious resource by far, followed by Soul because you're using two Souls a pop for your uh, Fry Heights. 
So it is limited by its resources and its card advantage is not the greatest. You clog up your hand with orders and you need to be placing products from the hand, which yes, they draw you a card to replace them, but that's not advanced. It's just going net neutral. So it's a bit unfortunate that way. So overall, it doesn't have the greatest survivability. So it needs to bank to end the game by turn three or turn four, or it's done for. It's very rare that Welsh will survive by that point, even if it is wiping out the opponent's field. So that's why it's only pretty solid. Rotovisor, uh, it's a new Nova Grappler card. It's pretty neat, I will say, but its main flaw is that it doesn't do enough. Not only does it need Counter Blast 2, and you have on hits in order to get Counter Charge from your uh, Arena cards, so its resources aren't really guaranteed for you, although yes, you could use Bulb Mine and stuff like that, it really just doesn't do enough. The multi-attack with the added power, it's underperforming compared to the multi-attack and power thresholds of other decks. Like, let's take something like uh, Grace Andre, for example. A lot of your attacks are probably hitting for like what is it 30k it feels like and then even more on persona turn because of the combination of the skills there this thing isn't really multiing for like more than maybe 30k max for each of them it feels like like they get a little 5k boosts and you don't restand a lot unless you get three arenas in there so it's very held back it just underperforms it needs some either good x factor to make it more pressuring or just a boatload more power to make the multi attack bludgeon your opponent as you stand it's pretty flawed that way Orphus Mass. Orphus Mass is pretty solid. Uh, a buddy of mine went to the Spring Fest with it recently, and it did kind of well. It does have a pretty strong offense thanks to the massive tokens that you're generating, and the Triple Drive could get you to some uh, pressure with triggers and stuff. But Orphus Mass uh, has pretty big defense issues, and it also has a resource issue sometimes. You also need to get rid of world cards in order to call your tokens, and you need, and this is an important bit for Orphus Mass in particular, you can only call tokens over circles with units. So against field control decks where they wipe your field, this is taxing on your hand even more in addition to a lot of the cards that you'll need to cough up just to survive. So it's a very go big or go home kind of OTK deck, but unlike Welstra, which has the X factor of giving more retires and maybe just a slight bit more stability to it because you know, this uh, Welstra just has that kind of support going for it. Warfist doesn't have that, so it's uh, it's further down compared to Welstra, but it is kind of like that deck, just in not quite as good a way. Prison. Prison is pretty solid. I'm going to put it up here. Prison just got a new card, which actually gives the deck uh, a lot of multi-attack going for it, and that, in addition to a lot of the resource cards it gets, like Blitzstaff Muna and also Rifle Royer, uh, you get more pluses, and I'm just going to say it straight up, uh, Seraph Pirate is probably the strongest great forest side from Ignis. This thing giving you just a ton of power and also the blanket criticals is nuts even to this day, and you can prison just as reliably as ever before. So hitting 10 is pretty easy, and once you hit 10, you can really bash your opponent's face in. They still have aquas for battle doors in addition to the boatload of power, so the criticals, the battle doors, the field controls, uh, even though it's not retarding like that, but you are imprisoning a lot of your opponent's cards, and then you're incentivizing them to use up their resources just to get their cards back. There's a lot of X Factors playing with a really solid foundation here. Uh, that said, it just recently got that multi-attack card, so I don't know if it's going to be very viable, but I kind of want to say it is, but I'm just going to put it at the very top of uh, pretty solid to be safe. That's where my instincts are leading me. Uh, Ava is also pretty viable. Uh, so this is going to be pretty ubiquitous for the glitter decks. The glitter decks got a huge upgrade. They got a new promo, which lets you ride into their upgraded forms from set 11, right? The upgraded forms were pretty strong burst potential. They were able to activate Persona Ride when they do, although these promos don't let you do that, but they do get you pretty strong searches. They give you a better offense with cases of things like Katama and whatnot. So they're just a better version of your glitter and you can get to them easier and faster and facilitate your gimmicks. Ava benefits from this pretty well. Poison is pretty good. And the Ava glitter deck has always been a bit ahead of the bell curve in terms of what it did and the value it produces for you. So yeah, it's, it's very viable, kind of towards the bottom here, but I think it's pretty viable. Heroes. Heroes is also very viable, and that's because it's a very primo rush deck. This deck could get three to even four attacks on grade two. 
yeah, that's quite a big deal. And with the new support I just got, the ability to use bases to get pluses and to defense yourself means that the deck has a lot of ways in which you can build it. It's very versatile and it could tank a lot of stuff. That said, it does have the blank minor issue of deck out because your bases are filtering out your decks very quickly. So that's going to be a bit of an issue, unfortunately, but it's very fast and it could kill you very quickly. I see this played a lot of my particular locals. So yeah, don't underestimate heroes. It can get you. It's a trial deck boss. Lascaria. It's neat, but it's flawed. Lascaria has an issue. Its issue is that even though it has a very, very, very strong defense thanks to the Blitzor recursion and the fact that Lascaria lets you get a counter charge without doing any counter blast whatsoever, which is a very absurd thing to have on a Vanguard. I mean, note the last time we had that for a Vanguard, uh, that was the Grade 3 Steam AV premium, and that deck ended up having a hit worthy meta stint to it. So. Uh, Bushi could eat their heart out with it, but thankfully Lascaria is held back by its one crucial flaw, which is its offense is kind of laughable. It doesn't hit very hard at all, and it's pretty peace reliant just to even get a decent board going to it, and its focus as a deck is on defending itself and maintaining your blitz order cycles. So because that's where its focus is, it can't close games at all. So it just sort of just sits there, surviving, but not really quite winning. So that's why it's all the way down here. Zorga Nadir. Zorga Nadir is pretty solid. Uh, Zorga Nadir, the new upgrade made Zorga as a strategy way more stable because you can alchem magic with cards in your bind zone. Now, I recently did a triple deck profile with it, outlining a lot of the different ways you can build Zorga. So, believe me when I tell you, this deck has. The sky's the limits in the way you can build this deck, but even with just a very typical mid-range or even somewhat aggro version of Zorga, you could kill people really quickly on turn 3 or turn 4 because you have very big numbers and your rear guards have crit pressure to them, and the divine skill lets you utilize your strongest column for a second attack, so you can blow up on the opponent out of nowhere quite easily. Of course, Zorga doesn't have anything that pushes it into the very viable because it does still have like the crucial failing if you need to set up your alchemagics pretty well and also see the particular pieces in the drop zone, like your roaming prison dragons or your abomination karmas. That's pretty easy, so you can kind of tangle with them. But I would just say it's really near the top of the very solid. It, nothing about it makes it kind of absurd like these guys because everything up here uh, either has an even more solid foundation to it or their win condition is rather insane like Blankmire. Zorga doesn't really have either of those. I may be underselling it a little bit personally. As a matter of fact, let me like, let me put it like right next to prison, right? These these two are like so good. They're so close to being very viable, but I haven't seen anything from them yet. This one, uh, it hasn't, you know, it just got its really crucial new support here. And this one just came out. So I don't know. Flagberg, uh, it's under supported. It hasn't been supported in a hot, like it just recently got some support, but it just gives it a little bit better power lines to it, and that's basically it. It's not the support it really needed. Let's move on. Trial deck, same as before. Chris Rain. Uh, Chris Rain is neat, but it's flawed, right? So the problem with Chris Rain here is that it doesn't have any multi attack aside from its divine skill. And it just has some very beat down shenanigans and some decent resources. It is a Vanguard that inherently gives you energy charge, which is really cool, but it costs a counter blast for it. And stuff like Anis also costs a counter blast for it every turn. And you don't really have convenient ways of counter charging that back in Lyrical Monasterio. A lot of the good counter charges are deck specific and Chris Rain can't access those. So that's an issue. That's a problem. It has been getting a little bit of support here. It just recently got Franchette, which is a nice beater that also gives you a self bound. So it gives you a little bit more of anti control strategies into it. And you don't have to use your divine skill for the mass bounced in order to get around control. But even so, its divine skill doesn't close games well enough. And without any other multi attack or just ways to really beat down your opponent, you're basically relying on your booster to have the super nice battle door skill on your opponent. Like the super battle door requires your opponent to call three of like differing uh, of different grades i believe right and that is pretty annoying for the opponent to deal with but that's basically all it's got and it doesn't perform very well so without the extra multi attack to really seal the deal it's slacking the offensive power flom uh flom is pretty solid now flom is going to go at the bottom here because i 
haven't seen a lot going with Flom, but it has a multi attack every turn, unlike Chris Rain. It gets an extra drive when you do this multi attack. And on top of that, the deck actually has some pretty nice pluses. The Vanguard pluses every turn. You're also able to recur uh, cards from the deck to the field. There's one that will literally let you add a Flom off top free for, th for free to the hand, which is quite a good plus if you can pull it off. Its crucial failing is that you need Flom names, and your Floms will retire themselves after they battle in order to utilize certain effects. Now, these are optional costs that you can pay, but it does mean that they incentivize you to constantly refill your field with extra Floms. But you can just choose not to do that. I mean, the Great Twos is not a big deal. In fact, it's uh, just a soul blast in order for a one for one versus your opponent, and the soul is kind of precious to the deck, which is another issue it has a lot like Leo Morda. So overall, it's just pretty solid. It's bordering on the flop. I think it compensates for its need for flops just well enough that it can push to the end zone. So I'm just gonna put it here and be a little bit generous for it. Kyoka just got new support, but I don't know where Kyoka is, right? So I think it's neat, but still, Kyoka just doesn't have the power level for this format at all. Relying on the magazines, yeah, you can get the magazines for, for consistently, but it doesn't give you enough benefit to rely on that kind of strategy. Shoto Doji, probably meta still. This deck's uh, early rush is legendary. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was probably one of the great equalizers of the format. Shoto Doji was taking it straight to the stride deck sets, which were Luard and Shernu, which we're actually gonna be getting to one of them pretty soon here, funnily enough, and I know any of you guys who've been impatient on that, don't worry, we're getting some of the big dogs right now. Uh, sure, sure, you can say that there was a bit of a hit with the Shoto Doji ride line, but that was against Shiranui, so Shoto Doji can still do its full power shenanigans, it's got Isazos, it's got Kage Chikas, it's got right on Kunai's for the defense. So its ability to just have a stable game plan and beat down your opponent super early and super fast, it's so nice. However, it's even better than Heroes in that regard because afterwards you can still get some nice resources and still have a pretty consistent beatdown and it just performs better overall and more cohesively com comparatively speaking. And it has had a lot of meta success, including top, not just topping, but winning worlds for standard this year, which is quite insane of a feat if you think about it. And it hasn't gotten hit since then, more or less. So yeah, it deserves to be up here. Tama. Tama is uh, a lot like that, right? Uh, I, I forgot to put heroes in front of Ava. Uh, as a matter of fact, it should also go above Liel and Morda. The uh, Tama is a little bit behind Ava, but just like Ava, it got the promo, which made it faster. And this promo, uh, this promo getting you to the new Tama is very important because it lets the Tama get a better multi attack with your uh, Rudimi and the Radamis getting an extra 5k. They poke. It's a very pokey type strategy, so even a little 5k can make the difference between hitting and not hitting in case your opponent hit a defensive. So that's quite nice and convenient for the deck. And the promo that it got for the ride also Energy Blast 3 to tutor out your glitters. And if you play the deck, then you know that you need to see four different glitter rear guards. You need to see your great two Rimiaronomies and your great one Rimiaronomies, one each at the bare minimum. Once you do that, you can keep sucking them into the soul and then calling them back out. And then from there, it's just a whole cycle and the deck feels perfectly online. But you need to get to that point and the promo definitely helps with that. But still, it's a little bit of a hiccup and the overall offense of the deck isn't that strong compared to the other glitters. So it's gonna be a little bit behind it, but still it's very viable, especially because it does have the unique defensive benefit of the blitz orders going for it so i like it quite a bit share uh yeah okay let me let me adjust this really quick right uh, we're gonna do it like that nah yeah like that right so <laughs> share Nui did take a hit which means that now it doesn't have the early rush going for it uh it can't abuse the shoujo dochi stuff shame on them and it also doesn't have the really dumb OT gimmick where you can use the OT to restand your opponent's vanguards and just go again. That's That was another really dumb thing about that deck, but of course it was just on the chance that you did hit OT, so it's a very niche situation they chose to hit there. Uh, funnily enough, it invalidates the Shiranui product because they give you uh, it, they give you the the Dragon of Drag Beta, that was his name. They give you the Drag Beta OT in that, so you're gonna have to find a different OT. But then again, you have to find a gen energy generator anyway, right? Because that's the new paradigm of uh, DZ. So go figure. It wasn't gonna be that good anyway. You need to improve it. Still, deck is very strong. Dominate, really good. They didn't hit the uh, multi-attack of this deck, like hardly at all. 
Shiranui is quite absurd because they have three different units that all have the ability to soul blast to stand on rear guards. They do it for different reasons. Esper Day is a bit more free because it doesn't rely on your opponent dominating, so that is quite nice. They didn't hit Esper Day with this, so your opponent, you can still do that with Shiranui. It's quite strong still, and it is one of the pinnacle of the strike deck sets. Uh, and it actually took a bit less of a hit compared to Luard, if I'm being real with you. So in that way, yeah, it's probably meta still. Shiranui is still around. I mean, hell, just the recent like Springfest stuff here, right? Like it was it was still running around. So yeah, prepare to fight this deck for a little bit while longer. It's going to take a bit to get him out of here. Deck is quite strong. I mean, did I just explain that properly? It has a 12 of three different units all of four copies that soul blast to restand uh, with varying degrees of power it's a 12 of and tenray can get you consistent pluses and you're multi-attacking things to dominate and you're also able to get the consistent triple drive because it's a stride and with a lot of power and the crest benefits this deck is absolutely insane Zetlons is under supported. It just got the one wave of support from the triple drive booster, and it just it doesn't have a very strong gimmick to it. The Smithies give you some power, some intercept. You can restand Zetlons, but it doesn't have any drive pressure on the restand. So imagine like Barga Dragress, but it doesn't get to have that divine skill. It's under support. It needs more to actually give it the cutting edge to win games. Uh, Corner Jet, I would say, is very viable. Chrono Jet is a stride deck set, and stride deck sets are inherently pretty damn strong. Now, while it doesn't have the really insane multi attack of Shiranui, and it also doesn't have the drag strider of the Luar deck down here, which we're going to get into that in a bit, right? It still has next stage into Chrono Jet, which is a pretty good game enter, but it's not quite there by comparison, right? So it, I'd say it's a pretty good because it is a stride deck set, and that props it up a bit, but it isn't tearing up the meta like it did during the set eight, set nine days, right? Chaos. Uh, chaos. <laughs> chaos, I think, is the glitter that benefited the most out of all the uh, ride promos, right? And that's because Chaos has a ridiculous OTK possibility with it. Soul Oratorio Chaos, when you ride into it, lets you soul charge three and then call a unit from your soul, any one, and also add any card back from the soul to the hand. So by riding into this, you immediately plus two, which means you can set up your mechanics again and you're getting more soul charge. If that wasn't bad enough, once you hit 13 cards with different names in your soul, which by the way can include the Chaos, uh, the original one you rode over, you bind the original Chaos and you you give 10k to your entire field and a critical and your mikanis get to restand afterwards that is a really good five attack turn like imagine a five attack turn right especially if you're able to achieve persona right imagine a five attack turn where the lowest attack is 33k yeah and even though you won't persona when you do it like this uh against a grade two opponent you can still get minimum 23k right and you're filtering out a lot of your deck, so you can still accrue a pretty decent hand advantage and sculpt your hand to the best of your ability. By God, if you hit, start hitting fronts or crits, you can just blow your opponent out of the water. There have been many a Chaos game where I just won while the opponent was on grade two and they just couldn't defend it, right? I mean, hell, even things like Solyron that I was just talking about, Gondiva, Prison, I've all will blow them out of the water just by playing chaos this deck will kill literally out of nowhere because so oratorio was definitely designed to be a turn four card and making it a turn three is way more devastating compared to these two where they give you more resources and more of a stable game plan this guy just wants to kill you dead and he's really good at it and he doesn't care if the opponent is at grade two so yeah really devastating Greedon, uh, yeah, Greedon is very viable here. I would say Greedon's like right around here. Uh, Greedon has a, a fair bit of top going on. The restand is quite nice, it's quite simple, and it just seems to be getting a lot of support these days. So whether you need card advantage, extra kill power, ways to enhance your Vanguard swings, more multi-attack, the whole shebang. Greedon's got it all, and it's under a pretty solid game plan overall. Of course, you do need the mask, but once you do have the mask online, which is fairly simple, and you also get access to Lindal Kia because you're using a mask in Dark States, it's it's go time from there. You can use the Goemon combo to get the Battle Door going to it once you suck him into the soul, so that's another really nice benefit to maximize the lethality of your front row. And on top of all of that, you do have the 7 in order to lose stipulation. Needing 7 damage to 
instead of six. It's quite nice. It almost feels like you're playing with Rezael, except one of the unique benefits of doing it with Greedon is that you can go to six damage and you can thereby prevent your opponent from six damage healing against you, uh, which is pretty nutty when you think about it. Unfortunately, if you are at six damage and you're playing against something like Shiranui, you're going to auto lose because once they dominate your Vanguard, uh, it's no longer your unit. So you're going to die at being six damage again. So do watch out in those matchups. Those can kind of auto lose you unless you choose not to be greedy. I know blasphemy in a deck where they call greed on, but that's where it is. Still pretty good. Saw a lot of tops. Uh, and yeah, overall, nice game plan. Omnigruzio. Omnigruzio fell off pretty hard, but it is still pretty solid, right? It's like right next to Orphis Mass, I say. Omnigruzio has a trigger nullification type of effect where your opponent can't get power from triggers, and it still has a Restanding Vanguard. Restanding Vanguard is one of the best forms of offense in this game, especially because it still gets to perform a drive check when it restands. And with the new support going with Linokia, again, that's another one that does it. And you can also use uh, some of the stuff that was intended for the Alma Jesters, right? You can bind, I think, like three triggers in a single turn, uh, which means that you can shut off three if your opponent's primary triggers. Like, let's well, usually an opponent is not going to be playing Rainbow. So you'll just turn off their three main triggers, meaning the only thing that they can get power from is an OT or maybe a four trigger. They do have to be playing Rainbow. They're one of the weird ones, right? So. It's a pretty strong strategy that way. It has kind of a good offense to back it up, and you can persona uh, against a grade three if you're going second, which is pretty good, right? It's the inherent benefit of playing the mask engine, but playing the mask engine is also kind of crappy, right? Despite the fact that the main Omnigruzio will literally peep top five to try and get you a mask or an Omnigruzio and your ride line also tries to fetch pieces, you can still surprisingly brick with this deck. And once you brick, it's basically game over. You don't bounce back quick enough to overtake a lot of the decks and level power of the Divine Z era. So once you brick, it's kind of bad. But if you do get your game plan off optimally, it's it kind of feels unfair to fight it against at some points, right? It's really devastating not being able to get your defensives and also losing shield value, which means that a lot of your shields are not that great anymore, right? I mean, imagine your effect draws and your effect fronts and they just don't have effects anymore. That just feels so sad, right? So when it goes off, it's really nice. When it doesn't go off, it's terrible. So it's just kind of in the middle of being pretty solid, but it's sort of on the lower end because this, this is kind of getting swept to the side in the modern day, right? I mean, I think even you get a little bit more viable than Omnigruzio because of the recent support for Alma Jester. Ignis. Mm. Ignis is at the very top of very viable, right? Um, ugh, crap, is it the very top or is it probably meta? Okay, the thing about Ignis is Ignis has a really big flaw that none of these decks up here have. And that flaw is that it's a turn four deck by nature. Once you get to turn four, the Ignis turn is insane, right? 15k to the front row, wipes out your opponent's entire back row. All of your opponent's front row units are zero power. And this thing gets a freaking critical. And you have multiple ways of getting restance on the rear guard. So it's usually a five attack turn and all on triple drive because yes, it is a grade four. This is a level of power and beatdown that rivals Stride deck sets, at least for a while. Stride deck sets can eventually uh, scale above it, particularly Sheer Nui, but it takes them uh, a couple turns to get to that. Right on, uh, right on turn four, yeah, you're getting this, and blow, it's right there. But the thing about Ignis is you have to get to turn four, and against decks like Shoujo Doji, you're not going to get that. It's not going to happen, man. They're going to beat you down so quickly. You're going to go to five by the time you even ride to grade three. Or even if you do have like grade four, the amount of draw power and also just the defensive options at her disposal is enough to usually survive one Ignis turn. You can survive one Ignis turn by the skin of your teeth, but a lot of decks are able to do it. It's particularly the very strong decks, right? And Ignis just has that one turn it usually doesn't get a second turn, especially if it had to go second. You'll just beat it up and win by that point, even though the deck does have a pretty good source of card advantage going in. A lot of your cards will net you cards to the hand, which is quite nice for it in all honesty. So it has oh, insane offense and good card advantage, but it's a bit slow. And being slow is painful in a format where I believe speed is key. So it's just gonna go at the very top of viable, but for all intents and purposes, this deck is still 
probably going to be meta to some extent or another, but it's debatable depending on who you look at. I think I just recently saw a Japanese list top again, right? Like, they're, they're, it's still around, so watch out for it, right? Minerva. Minerva is pretty solid. Uh, I'd say, like, right around here. Minerva has never really grown out of style, right? Extra 5k to the front row continuously. The Persona turns are very strong. You get Vanguard Bolt T-Tag, very good that way. Minerva has really nice support with like Rebel Limb and Thosis and whatnot. It's a Keter deck, so you get a lot of the Keter card pool going for you. It's all really nice stuff. Of course, there's nothing that really pushes it over the edge in the modern day because it's only comparable to the offenses that a lot of other decks bring. It's just a bit more stable with it, and the multi attacks can burst your opponent out on a persona turn if you choose to really go ham with your chamomiles. So yeah, overall, a pretty dang solid deck, even to this day. And it did have some tops of like during set A format, especially since its heyday. But even now, I'd say it, it's definitely worth giving a whirl, even, even if just at your locals. Hexa. Hexa is also pretty solid. Hexa, I see this thing still running around. Getting the extra drive check, being able to restand with massive powers, modifying your triggers, it's all really nice. It's also a Keter deck. Hexa Orb has a lot of nice support to it that's very exclusive to the Hex Orb card pool. Because if you ever look at the Keter Sanctuary card pool, there's a lot that say Hexa Orb, more particularly Sorceress in its name, and that's referring to her. And she is the same name as the original Hex Orb Sorceress, so you can get a persona on that as well. The deck is pretty strong that way. One of the things that does hold the deck back a bit, though, is that it does require the persona right to get going at maximum potential which is something that a lot of these decks don't really need to say about it i mean there's a couple exceptions like Rezael, but i mean we already discussed why that thing without persona is pretty damn stable and nutty right so hexa does take a little bit longer to going but it's a very very strong deck right it's about at the level of what minerva zorga can bring to the table i'd say it's pretty damn good thegria um yeah, uh, Thegria is just alongside the other glitters here, and for a lot of the same reasons. Uh, the the ride promo is a little bit funny with that one and what it does with the Who to Justice, but that's just because the Persona ride gimmick of Thegria is a bit inherently complicated anyway. There's not a lot to talk about here. It still just hits very big numbers, and it has the really busted order where your Persona ride becomes 15k, you draw two instead of draw one. So that order really carries it a lot, right? Uh, it's just a Persona deck through and through, still the same, right? I'd say it definitely got a pretty good benefit from it, but overall the game plan hasn't dramatically changed. So the convenience that these things bring and the sheer OTK potential that this thing brings, I don't think that you're quite stacks up to it, but it's still on the same basic level. Bastion. Yeah, Bastion's still around, guys. Beatdown is quite nice. The deck can get up to four drive checks in a turn, which is really strong. A lot of the Bastion support cards are pretty good for drawing cards, being really beefy. You can give your front row resist, so that is super good against some field control decks. You can have some consistent pressure uh, against them. You can tell decks like Blangemire to F off. So Bastion has a lot going for it, right? It's not in the probably meta because I don't think its performance is quite at the level of insanity where these guys have some insane X factors or they're super rushy or they're a stride deck set or something like that. Bastion is just literally one tick away from it, right? Like, hell, I, I'd actually say it's a little bit more up here right like let's 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 put it like this there we go yeah yeah yeah. yeah that, that I, I think i like how that looks um it it's pretty good it, it is pretty good like it's around java's level but it doesn't quite make it to the top in my opinion youth um so youth uh, yeah i'd say youth is like Youth is a little bit weird to me because it doesn't seem like it's able to OTK in the same... Oh, but it actually got... Yeah, I'm going to say Youth is like right around here, I'd say. It's like pretty neck and neck with what Chrono Jet's able to do. Chrono Jet's a bit slower, Youth is a bit faster, but uh, Chrono Jet does have a bit more of an insane win condition once you get it really rolling and start getting your crest powers and stuff. Youth uh, youth was a little bit of a one-trick pony. When Full Blast came out, you know, and after people stopped clowning on it because we got the... Uh, couple cars that let you get revolve from the soul quite easily 
it was definitely tearing it up because it was quite fast. But now you have other decks that are also pretty fast, like Hero and like Shoujo Doji that are also doing it, but they're a lot more stable in their ability to put out really big turn two and turn three boards, right? Youth's turn three is quite incredible, but unless you get specifically all three revolve forms in there by the time you're in turn three, your first turn full blast is not gonna be that great. And then once you get to turn four full blast, well, yeah, turn four full blast is still pretty strong, but I mean, just look at Dragal Ignis. Once it got to turn four, it's doing even more than full blast does. And then anything at that point or past that point, the stride deck sets are also gonna outscale you. Things like Varga Dragress is probably also gonna be more deadly, comparatively speaking. So full blast is really reliant on needing to see a really strong setup for turn three if it can get a good turn three then it has one of the best if not the best turn threes but that's it that's the only thing that keeps it pretty damn viable I mean, it does have the Keter card pool going for it, but a lot of full blast builds don't utilize too much of the Keter card pool because they invest a lot of deck space to trying to make the Revolve forms a viable strategy in the first place. You need to get ways of putting them in the soul or you're not gonna have the good turn three and then your deck flounders. So it's deck restrictive. So it can't quite utilize the Keter card pool in the same way that something like Liel or especially Rezael could. So that's a bit unfortunate, especially since, especially since uh, you used to be able to do that but it became really linear and really depend on the turn three so yeah while i still think it's very viable it's not quite like what these guys are right luard hey what's up buddy come up up here friend um uh, i'd say luard is at the very bottom of the probably meta luard lost cell count that's an issue that is a really really big issue for it but even without cell counts giving it the multiple pluses every turn your drag striders is still quite impressive but one of the problems with drag strider is that unlike something like blanked Meyer, it can still get elementaria sanctitude so i don't know uh oh yeah no 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 it's it's like right here I'll put it up here for now because Luard still has a pretty good base to it and it is one of the better strike deck sets and it has a stronger win con than Chrono Jet does. So yeah, it does have all that going for it and I, I I just had to I just had to put it a bit lower than everything else because the cell counts hurt quite a bit. Hey, look at Luan. He's in the same boat as uh, Zetland. It's not enough payoff and not enough support. Messiah. Messiah is pretty solid. Um, I'd say Messiah is like right around here. It's a bit above some of these other Will Dress era decks, uh, just because it is a strike deck set, but it is definitely the weakest of the strike deck sets, unfortunately. It doesn't have enough of a winning offense to go for. I mean, your Vanguards are pretty big, and that's about it. But between the Guard Restricts from this, the Guard Restrict with Crit and Drive from this, and the ridiculous level of multi-attacks between Dominate and the 12 of Restands, right? Uh, yeah, these all have much stronger kill turns compared to Messiah, unfortunately. And also, Messiah is a little bit more peace-reliant, comparatively speaking, honestly. Especially since uh, this one can search out its pieces, and this one has a 12 of. I can't stress that enough. Yeah, this one's only pretty solid. Magnolia. Uh... Magnolia is a turn four deck, but it could become a turn three deck, so that's pretty nice. I'd say Magnolia also got some pretty good support, so I'd say it's right around Almagester, like right in between Almagester and Orphis Mass. The offense is quite nice. You can get up to six attacks. You get some pretty big numbers. Yes, you are relying on the thing to get you up to the turn four ride, so it's kind of like these guys a bit, but these guys are uh, actually still pretty solid in their payoff overall, uh, comparatively speaking, and it's just a decent uh, grade 4. It used to be pretty top dog, especially Inlet Pulse, but that's just because the amount of advantage and attacks was a little bit overwhelming for the format. Now, the level of power to those attacks isn't that big of a deal, and also going to Soul to Draw one's a bit more of a standard pun intended for standard compared to back then where in the pulse felt like a really insane resource card for stoic a card pool so if anything in little endless pulse is a bit of fraud alert i don't know why that card is as expensive it is it's not as good anymore so yeah i'd, I'd say it's right around here it's, it's pretty solid but i don't think it's particularly viable compared to a lot of these guys which will definitely beat you up a bit harder Aroa, yeah, he's he's like right here, I'd say. Yeah, he, he's right in the middle in terms of the glitters. What they get from their rides and how strong he is, yeah, he's right there. 
Magnolia Mask. Uh, Magnolia Mask is neat, but it's, it's flawed because it's Magnolia, but it requires the it requires the freaking mask engine, dude. <laughs> Enough said. The mask engine makes it kind of inconsistent, it feels like. I mean, yeah, it gets retires, man, and it can use a lot of the same stuff that Magnolia Elder can, but Elder is way more stable, and it does have some support that are geared more towards it. So, yeah, Elder is definitely the better of the two. Leonorn. Uh, Leonorn is very viable. Leonorn is a set 13 deck, and a lot of set 13 decks are generally going to be pretty damn good. But Leonorn, I think, has tapered off in its offense, comparatively speaking. Uh, it has some pretty good numbers, but I don't see it beating up people particularly as well. Uh, but it's still pretty good. <sighs> yeah, let me put it like. Let me put it like right here, I'd say. Yeah, I'd say like right here. Um, I know Green on Mask is kind of high, but personally, I think Green on Mask is very good. Uh, so this is more one of the subjective ones. Yeah, Leonorn is right next to Youth. Uh, it's not quite as reliant on turn three because it has to wait till turn four for what it does. But its turn four is pretty strong. It's just that it's not as strong as Tragic Ignis, dude. And it's not as strong as like the Persona Ride turn of something like a Bark of Tragress. But six attacks is still quite nice. You can still get some good numbers. And if you can go to turn five with it, it's pretty good. So it has the power level of a set 13 deck, but it's a bit lower than a lot of set 13 decks. Deck. So it's still just very viable overall. Mushi King. Mushi King, uh, I don't have a lot of experience against this deck, but Mushi King is pretty solid. So I'd probably say it's like right around here. Uh, you know, it's this rung of pretty solid is the pretty tried and true ones or new, but definitely very promising. Whereas these ones are, yeah, they're pretty solid, but they're more towards the there is a flaw or two holding it back. And Mushi King somewhere like right in the middle, it feels like. Kairi, um, uh, Kairi, um, I don't think, yeah, I don't think Kairi is, like, all that good. Uh, Kairi feels like it's, like, actually right around, like, Chris Rain's level. Kairi doesn't have enough of a strong offense what it does. It has a lot of card advantage going for it, but a lot of these decks have strong offenses and strong card advantages going to them, and it just has one part of the equation, and also it's a great four deck. So unless you can get the Ride Line Skipper, which also requires the opponent to be at grade three, it's not very good. So uh, if you go first, you can't capitalize on going first very easily. So yeah, it has some pretty big flaws going for it, unfortunately. <clears throat> going against it, I should say. Willista. Willista is uh, pretty strong. It's not quite as uh, strong as it was before. The ban list actually like, relieved it a bit. So I actually think it actually still has a chance here in this format. So it's above Flom. It's right around some of the other Wildress era decks. But nothing particularly putting it above the others, right? I'm kind of speeding through these a little bit because the video is starting to drag on a little bit. Uh, this one is kind of the same way, really. It's uh, I'm going to put it right next to Orphis Mask because it has a similar level of beatdown to it, and it's kind of insane once you get to the Persona turns, but you do kind of need to get to the Persona turns to really beat it up. The, the main appeal of Powerful, uh, yes, it is Powerful. Again, another one of the many puns that have been attended in this video. <clears throat> oh man, I'm losing my voice. Let me get a sip of water. Anyway, where was I? So with Powerful, it has a rear guard where you counterblast two, but the counterblast can be mitigated by this thing. So it's really more like a counterblast one, if anything. You counterblast and it gets a drive check and a bunch of power and that power stacks. So when you restand it, it'll be able to get another 10K power and it'll be able to drive check again. So you get a lot of drive pressure with this thing and it can be kind of scary and has a lot of advantage. And the power lines are actually pretty decent for it. It's pretty powerful. <laughs> But it's nothing above the bell curve, so it feels like it's more contending with these guys, right? But it also really does require that specific powerful unit to get going. So its peace reliance puts it more towards the, it does kind of have a flaw, but it's not like so hampered by its flaws. It can usually get its job done. Fennel is Gravidia, but probably not even as good. So yeah, it's quite flawed, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, it rel for those of you guys who don't know, it relies on the trick or treats, but the trick or treats are mainly just for resource accruing. Fennel can give a crit to itself into another rear guard, which is kind of nice, but it doesn't particularly make those crits super threatening, unfortunately. So there's not a lot going on with Fennel. It's just kind of a cute deck, if anything. I, I wish it was better, though. I, I, I tried it. I wanted to make it better. Charmot is very viable, dude. Uh, Charmot can beat you up. 
Uh, like, holy crap, can't... You know, I think I'm actually gonna put Liel more a little bit lower here, because the more I look at her, the more I'm like, yeah, it uses the Keter card pool, but... It's not, it, I, I don't know if it's quite there. It does have a six attack turn though. So I'm just going to keep, but you know, Leonor also has a six attack turn with perhaps a similar level power to it. So actually, yeah, these two are fittingly good for each other, right? So uh, what was I thinking? This is better. Charmot though uh, has a four attack turn, but they get really huge numbers and you get an extra drive check from the back row center. So a lot like powerful, you get drive pressure from your rear guards, but what puts this apart from powerful is that the numbers were reliably huge be especially because you have reese's to put on your vanguard the other thing about uh charmot is you have the ability to call stuff from soul and because you call stuff from soul pale moon style you're you can maintain your board pretty easily it's a pretty stable game plan that isn't prone to fail and you can also tutor out other louis i'm not quite sure how to pronounce that french even to this day i try hard though uh i, I just always forget it you can get that board back pretty freaking easily dude and it doesn't even matter what you choose to get the uh, drive check because they're all going to become the power of your vanguard so they're all e equally extremely huge especially on a persona ride turn so it's just a pretty typical beat down deck with a lot of drive pressure to it but because it can retain its board a bit better than some other decks it does have that going for it against control strategies so yeah and plus it's actually been pretty successful so i know for a fact that it's pretty good on that alone uh here's prism so <laughs> prism i would say is at the bottom of very viable because it is very viable but against control decks one of the reasons why prism has been seeing as many plays as it does is because of hard counter shiru nui which is a very very meta deck right so go figure that's the reason why as as we go away from like something like shiru nui being the top dog this will probably go lower but for the current moment it is very viable so this is a very format situational placement for prism because it doesn't do things exceptionally well but it does really lean on the bermuda gimmick of returning your cards back to hand to a degree that most of their Bermuda slash lyrical decks can't. So that's really nice. I'm going to skip the token stuff because I don't know what they're all about. I don't know what this is all about, and I don't think Ebisu is really worth talking about uh, in this day. I haven't heard anything about that in the longest time. Uh, so I, I don't know. I just throw it like down there or whatever. Uh, or actually, no, I'll just ignore because I, 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 I don't know what I don't know. This is pretty solid. Uh, this this deck can tank a lot, uh, and it also has the ability to uh, defend using your grade three in the hand, and it redirects an attack onto a rear guard. So it's a lot like that old school Link Joker card for Glendios, where it redirected an attack from Glendios to one of your reverse units. Uh, yeah, I fought it against this a few times on stream, and it is pretty good. It was able to tangle with things like Bastion, but ultimately, I don't think its offense is quite there. And if something goes wrong in your game plan, you can quite easily get blown out of the water so it feels like it sort of puts up a strong front if anything it's a pretty good deck though my go is uh very viable uh yeah my go was doing a lot of stuff uh but i'm gonna put it like right there i'd say yeah my my go it can do some pretty crazy things i'm not too knowledgeable on it but i've seen so many of the uh resulting lists and it is coming over to the west so it is definitely worth talking about and yeah it's kind of a boogeyman for some people but i don't think it's like in the very big probably meta dudes because we don't really know how it's gonna perform in the west and i think it has been tapering off a bit over time as of late so i'm gonna be safe and putting it in the very viable for now finally uh there's griffo which is oh, it's not good you have the, the Griffo has one of the most crucial failings of a deck in this format, which it has zero early game. You're stuck on the grade zero Griffo seat the entire time. You can't call any grade ones or twos on your grade one or two turn. You have to wait until turn three, and then you get into the big dumb dragon, right? And, and the deck is neat, and you can get OT on turn five and stuff. But not only is this extremely telegraphed, but it means you don't have your OT until that point. So you can't offensively check or defensively check your OT until that which is kind of a big left arm behind your back kind of maneuver for a deck when your opponent has no qualm second against you at any point in the game. So that's quite unfortunate as well. And even if you can get it to turn five, it's very situational. You need to damage check a card for yourself deliberately of your own accord. So you need to damage mitigate to a certain degree. 
and you need to survive to turn five, which there's nothing about the deck that has too much pressure. Like you have a pretty big Vanguard with a crit, but unless you're playing the Dragon Empire version with Esper Adea, which is pretty clunky and peace reliant, you're not getting a multi-attack with it. So you don't have that much pressure, unfortunately. And don't even get me started on the whole 10 Hydrogram to get like extra 10K continuously, because not only is that super hard to achieve, but you can just get rid of your opponent's rear guards, like even just tapping one of them off the field by effect or by battle is going to turn that off and then suddenly your griffo's not a big deal anyway and sure the 18k base is cool but i mean mlb is now at a 20k base which i'm not i oddly mlb wasn't on this list so that kind of sucks i kind of wanted to talk about uh, actually mlb so Oof, but if I were to put MLB, I probably would have put him around the pretty solid here because with that new Blaster Blade, the Vanguard has extra multi attack and the big defense is such a sweet X factor, but it's not really blowing out your opponent with massive attacks, unfortunately, like a lot of these decks are, nor is its win condition something on the level blanked Meyer or something like Drag Strider Luard. So yeah, that's where it falls behind. I missed a few decks here, unfortunately, but the video is already pretty long. So please, please, please ask me what decks you would like. Maybe if it's like Lutitia, Graham Grace, Favreal, stuff like that. If there's anything that I missed here, which I did, then tell me and I'll give you my honest opinions on where they probably fall on this tier list here. I think I did a pretty good job. There's a pretty good uh, variance between the tiers. You can see they're filling up quite nicely throughout all the brackets. Not a lot of probably metas, but it's clearly not like a super hogged up spot. And a few of these guys are definitely contending there as well. I just decided to be a little bit less charitable with them. It's overall a pretty decent format. Standard has some failings with the early rush element of it it's really easy to get beat down it's also really easy to get sacked out of nowhere any format that possesses the ot inherently possesses an element of autonomy where luck overcomes skill and on that note it's not a, a very skill-based format in the first place these days it feels more like you pilot your deck and you just do your deck's gimmick and it either wins or loses so that's a little bit unfortunate of a turn we've taken in this format so i don't really quite like standard unfortunately it doesn't feel very nice it does feel very gratifying as a person who wants to invest time into it because you're not going to get the payoff for trying to get skillful play out of this format but it is still pretty fun and there's a lot of variety in the decks you can test out and as you can see there's a lot of uh, different strategies you can take on so any of these guys up here and also some of these guys here uh yeah you can in the pretty solid you you can take any of them to like your locals your spring fest maybe even trying to attempt to play your hand at a bcs and they could do pretty decently well so a lot of people have got a shot at this so i do kind of think the dz format is in a healthy position especially now that luard and sheer nui have been taken down a peg but we'll have to see how far down a peg i'm not convinced they're not going to be meta which is why they're both up there but we'll see just in case right again this is kind of dubious to a degree it's very subjective so you guys tell me if there's anything that you think is vehemently wrong with this list anyway that's going to do it this is a very long tier list but i definitely wanted to get this out there now that set two has been done and i think it's a pretty good one so I've already said it multiple times, but comment down below what you think about it. If you do like this tier list, then I have some of those yield tier lists from way ago that you can check out if you want to see some other legacy videos. But aside from that, some of my current content involves my discussion videos, my top tens, and also my fight night. So go ahead and check out any of those if you're craving some more Vanguard content. I got you covered. And if you like what you see, consider leaving a subscribe and notification bell for next time we upload a video. And with that, take care. God bless.